Tonight's topic is one of a certain sensitivity. So first, thanks for being here and engaging in the conversation because sometimes we hear transgender or gender identity or gender dysphoria and we immediately put up our defenses or prepare an assumption. Tonight, our speaker has lived in those realities and will share firsthand experience of how the Lord redeemed her out of a transgender lifestyle and the process and the healing. Tonight's speaker is Kathy Grace Duncan. Born female, Kathy Grace lived as a man for 11 years uh, before coming out of that lifestyle into a freedom and redemption through the Lord Jesus Christ. Kathy Grace is involved with the Portland Fellowship. She leads the women's ministry there, teaches with the Taking Back Ground program, chairs the board of directors, and is involved with the Changed Movement. Kathy Grace's testimony has been featured in numerous interviews with NBC News and the Family Research Council. And tonight, she joins us for our Friday Forum. So please, on behalf of the Ambassadors Forum, welcome Kathy Grace Duncan. Wow, thank you. Um, so I, what I wanted to do is I wanted to take like a broad stroke and kind of tell you how I got to where I was, but then really elaborate on the work that the Lord did to bring me out of that in my healing process. Um, so before the age of four, uh, I felt that I should have been born a boy. And I would ride my tricycle over to pick up my girlfriend and we were going to get married. I knew that wasn't normal, so I kept it a secret. And then as I went into school, I still had that longing to be a boy. I still wanted to be that grow up and be a boy. There was this, I don't know, urge, this feeling, longing that I should have been a boy, a belief, if you will, that I should have been a boy. I was born into the wrong body. And this followed me all the way. So before I went to kindergarten, all the way through high school. Growing up, my family dynamics were dysfunctional. Um, my dad was verbally and emotionally abusive to my mom. And, you know, as a young child, I didn't have the tools to be able to discern my dad's not a good guy. Instead, I took that on as, you know, women are hated, women are weak, and women are vulnerable. But then I watched my mom, who's supposed to be my role model, and I watched her as she, you know, acted vulnerable, hated, and weak. She didn't stand up to my dad. She was constantly crying, you know, and I, I just saw her as this vulnerable, weak, hated woman, you know. And again, at a very young age, I didn't know how to dissect that. I didn't have the tools. And so in my mind, I thought, okay, if that's what it's going to look like, I don't want to be that. But then my dad, I don't want to be that man either. So at a very young age, I made this vow. I'm going to be the man my dad is not. And that carried me forward. Um, my little brother was born. He was celebrated, which told me again, you know, being a woman wasn't good. It also brought in another lie that as a girl, I can be replaced. Because by then, my dad had kind of moved away from me and poured everything into my little brother. Or so that was my interpretation. Between the ages of 10 and 12, I was molested by a family member, which again ingrained those lies. Women are weak. Women are hated and uh, women are vulnerable. So I'm carrying this forward. Uh, eventually I made friends with a neighbor boy and I shared, him, shared with him that I, I want to be a boy. And he was like, yes, this is great. We can be brothers. So I had that bit of affirmation enough to go, you know what, I'm on the right road. I am doing the right thing. Um, eventually I became desperate at the age of 19. I moved out of the house. I changed my name, found a doctor and began uh, hormone treatment. And I thought I was free. I was like, I've arrived. I'm going to be this man. This is going to be awesome. Here I am the person I always should have been. Um, and when I moved out, I moved in with a family. It was a single mom. She had two daughters. And these two daughters, they went to church, and uh, after about two weeks, they kept bugging me to go to church with them. Now, I was raised Lutheran, and hear me, I don't think there's anything wrong with that, but the church that I went to, I, I learned about God, but I never really knew about Jesus. 
Um, and so I, I joke and I say I'm a God stalker because I knew about God, but I never really knew God. Like stalkers know that, you know, they know about their victims. And so I was like this God stalker. And, you know, that's kind of all the knowledge that I had. I did get confirmed, but I, I never really had a relationship with God or Jesus. So I started this church and they're talking about Jesus. And I'm thinking, who is this guy? I, I, I've never heard about this guy. He sounds amazing. I think I want to know him. I think I want to accept him as my Lord and Savior. So there was a night service. They did an altar call and I go down and I accept the Lord as my Savior. And um, I, you know, changed my name, started taking hormones, living as this man, and I accept Jesus. I got up the next morning, nothing had really changed. So I thought, well, maybe I didn't do it right. So I took the next two altar calls because each morning I would wake up and I was like, I don't know, is this working? Did it take? Is there something else I need to be doing? And the pastor finally spoke to me and he said, you know, the first time that you did this, it really did work. It's like, oh, all right. So, you know, being young in the faith, I didn't know how to discern the Lord's will for my life. So I thought because I didn't hear anything, there wasn't any lightning, there was, you know, he didn't strike me dead or any of that. I thought he was okay with my lifestyle. So I continued on to live as a man. Uh, there was a woman that I went to church with and um, she got me a job at where she worked. And my dad also found out where I worked and he came in and told my manager, you know, that's really not a man who's working for you. That's my daughter. Needless to say, I got fired from that job. And um, the woman who got me the job also overheard that conversation. She went to the pastors, rightly so, saying, hey, I, I heard this information. You know, I, I, this is what I know. So I get called into the office um, there at the church and they asked me, they said, you know, we're hearing these rumors about you. And we just want to know, who are you? Who are you really? And at that time, my truth was, I'm a man who used to be a woman. And that's what I told them. I'm a man who used to be a woman. And they're like, um, you know, we love you, but I, you can't come back here. So I was like, okay, this is great. Lost my job, lost my church. But there was something inside me, though, that I knew that wasn't the heart of the Lord. So I found another job. Um, and at this job, there was a Christian woman that I met, and eventually we began to date. I started going to church with her, and she actually showed me that, you know, we don't read our Bibles just on Sunday. Because, <laughs> you know, being raised Lutheran, that was, that was what I was taught, is we read, we read the Bible on Sunday, and we're good for the rest of the week. And so I started, you know, engaging in my Bible, and, you know, I was like, wow, this, this is amazing. And then eventually, uh, her and I broke up. And I jumped right into relationship, total rebound relationship. And in this rebound relationship, I um, started with a pornography addiction. And it was a very deep pornography addiction. Uh, it, was, it was bad. And I would view pornography once, at least once a day, if not more. And um, it, it was bad. And while I was in this rebound um, relationship, I woke up one morning and I realized, oh no, I'm my dad and she's my mom. Everything that I vowed I would not do, I had become. And everything I hated, I was. So I broke up with her because I realized, you know, I, I can't treat her like this. I, I saw the, you know, the damage it did to my mom. I, and I don't want to be that man. So we broke up. And at that time, I had got more involved at the church. They had an orchestra and I played French horn. So I got involved in the orchestra and playing French horn. And uh, on my way to orchestra practice one night, for, for those of you who are local, I was on Highway 26 on my way to Vancouver just before the tunnels there. And the Lord spoke to me and he said, will you now, will you now? So I, I take this inventory of my life and I'm like, wow, there's nothing in the way. There's no reason why I can't. So I said, yes, Lord, I will. Continued on, went to orchestra practice. It was about three months later. I suddenly realized sometimes I can be a little slow on the uptake, but it took me about three months and I realized, oh my gosh, I'm, 
free from this pornography addiction. And as I thought about it, I realized it was that night that I said yes to the Lord, that he delivered me from this pornography addiction. And it was bad. Um, so I was free and, I, and I'm still free from that addiction. So in this time, after I said yes to the Lord, I began to open my heart and my life everywhere. I just sought him with everything that I had. And eventually I got involved in the junior high ministry and I, I was a small group leader for a group of boys. I got involved in the men's group and I was leading a men's Bible study. Uh, I was attending the college age group and then I was also attending the single age group. Um, and I was just involved with everything pouring my heart out, you know, wanting more of the Lord, just seeking him. And they were like, I think we have leadership material here. And so at that same time, the Lord brought along a couple and they became my spiritual parents. And I didn't know it at the time, but the Lord revealed that um, Gary, who was my uh, spiritual dad, he actually was using Gary to begin to work on my dad's stuff because it was all crammed in there. <laughs> There was a lot. And I, this guy just loved on me. And I can remember he was praying for me and I was really struggling. And I thought, you know what? I, I need to tell him the truth about me so he can pray correctly. Because I wanted his prayers to be effective and help me with my struggle. I was dealing with a bunch of fear. And so I shared with him and, you know, he didn't really say anything. There was really nothing else said about it at all. And, um, I had gone to a junior high retreat and spent the weekend with these kids skiing and that. And at that time, I had gotten another girlfriend and I encouraged her to become a part of the junior high ministry. And we came home that weekend and I was dog tired. You know, those kids, they just wore me out. And so I was looking forward to staying home. But my girlfriend calls and she's, hey, can we go to evening service? I'd really like to go and, you know, I'll meet you there. And I'm like, all right. So I go, service is ending. We're standing in a group talking to people and my spiritual dad walks up and he says, um, can I talk to you? And in my heart, I was like, oh, you know, I think I'm going to be confronted. I, I'm pretty sure I know what this can I talk to you thing is. So I'm sure. So I follow him. We go behind the sanctuary. There's a little prayer room in there. And in there is the pastor of the college age group. And he and I were good friends. We hung out, you know, so I knew him. He knew me. And as soon as I walked into that room and saw him, I was like, yep, here we go. I'm going to be confronted. So I sat down and uh, Dave was the pastor. And he said to me, you know, we're hearing some rumors about you. And I just want to know, who are you? Who are you really? Same question. Only this time I answered with, I'm a woman living as a man. <laughs> And that was the truth. And as soon as I said that, the Holy Spirit went and, and blew into me. And in that moment, I realized I need to go back to being the woman he created me. I need to go back. I got to get out of this lifestyle. And, oh, and I, I got to step down from these ministries and I need to meet with this pastor and I got to break up with my girlfriend. And, you know, just all these things were running through my head. And so I looked at Dave, didn't share what I had just experienced. And I said to him, well, what do you think I should do? And Dave said, well, um, you know, how about you live as a eunuch? And I'm like, no. And he's like, okay, well, how about um, maybe you live celibate for the rest of your life? And I'm like, no. And he's like, well, okay, how about we, um, maybe you should, uh, yeah, I don't know what you should do. I, I have no, I've never dealt with this before. So I said, well, can I share with you what I just saw? And he's like, yeah. So I shared with him, I need to go back to being a woman. I need to meet with these pastors. I need to step down. And I feel like I need to do this in the next two weeks. Oh, and I need to go break up with my girlfriend. And Dave's like, all right, um, let's do this. You know what? I, I will help you make those appointments with those pastors. I'll be there with you in these appointments as you step down. And um, let's do this. Totally different response, you know, and he did just that. He made the appointments and he sat with me in the appointments as I told him why I needed to step down. Well, interesting enough, the next day I went into work, it was a Monday, and 
nothing to do with what just happened the night before at church, I got fired from my job. And I, I don't, it was so lame. I can't even remember why they fired me. I, I, I'm just like, are you kidding me? But at the same time, I knew that was the Lord clearing the way for me to walk out, you know, of this lifestyle and come back to being the woman that he created me to be. So I called Dave, hey, guess what? Got fired from my job. Looks like we can start these appointments anytime. So at that time, I was living up in Vancouver and I was living with a family. And um, I was laying on the trampoline and I was just thinking about everything that had happened and how big this was. And I was so overwhelmed. I just, I wasn't sure how this was all going to play out. And I said to the Lord, Lord, how, how is this going to happen? This is so big. And the Lord said to me, you need to learn about grace. And at that point, he was talking about the divine enablement grace. And I'm thinking, okay, whatever. I'm not sure how that's going to help, but okay, sure. Um, and then I moved out from there and I moved back to Portland. And um, I, there was a, a two women that were involved in the Portland Fellowship already. So I moved in with them and I began the journey out. And um, the first year of the journey out, I was unemployed, which I was grateful for because I went through really severe depression. I didn't know it then. Uh, but it, it was hard, you know, it took me what felt like all day to get out of bed. And, and then once I made it downstairs, I'm like, oh, great. Now I got to make coffee. This is going to take a while. And I would go in and I would, you know, try to take a shower and I'd run the water and it, I was like, oh, now I got to get in the shower. Everything was so hard, so heavy. And um, I'd go take a shower and then I'd go straight to bed because I was exhausted, you know, and this was at two o'clock in the afternoon. I'm already so tired. And I was grateful when I had things to do during the day because it, it made me be a little more forceful and intentional about getting up and getting ready and doing these things. Well, during that time, I did make a huge effort to spend time with the Lord. Cause I thought, you know what, you called me out of this. You're kind of the only person who knows how to do this because I don't. And, um, I met with the, the women's ministry leader at that time at the Portland fellowship. And she told me later that as she was sitting across the table from me, she's looking at me. And I remember her looking at me and I'm thinking, do I have something on my face? What's the problem? And she told me later that, yeah, I was looking at you that way because I kept thinking there's a woman in there somewhere. So I want to, at this point, before I really get into the process, I want to show you um, what I looked like uh, before the process started when I was in the lifestyle. So let me share my screen here. Um, can everybody see that? Can everybody see my pictures? Yes. Okay, got a thumbs up. Awesome, thank you. Um, so this is me right here. Um, that's not my girlfriend. That was, uh, I believe it was my girlfriend's niece at the time or her cousin or somebody. Um, so this is what I look like in the lifestyle. Oh, that was supposed to go forward. Hang on here. I don't know what happened. Let me try this. Okay. I apologize. I even practiced before I did this. So let's see. I'm assuming you can see that. I'm hoping this will. Huh? Well, shoot. Um, I apologize. I, I had this, like I said, I had this all set up. Um, with the pictures. So let me just, uh, I'll just show you a few of them at a time. So here's the next one. Um, I make that bigger. This is, so this is me here in the red. I'm hoping, can you guys see that? I can't see you, so I can't tell. Oh my gosh, I'm so sorry. Like I said, I practiced all of this. Uh, 
Um, I'm not sure if you guys are able to see. Yeah, Kathy Grace, we can see it. Oh, you can. Okay, good. I'm, I apologize because I'm like, I don't know. I can't tell. Okay. Let me see if I can go forward. Oh, there we go. Can, did you see the next one? I'm a cowboy. Yes. yes. Okay, good. Whew. Thank you, Lord. All right. So here I am as a cowboy. And uh, one of the jokes that I like to make is um, I always wanted to be a cowboy. Always, always, always wanted to be a cowboy. Now I want to marry one. Um, here's uh, another one in lifestyle. I was probably about, uh, I don't know, 26, 27 there, something like that. Um, and then here I am. This is fairly, so I, I came into the lifestyle when I was 19. This one, I, I was probably about 21, 22, not too long on the hormones. And uh, I recently just got this picture. And when I looked at it, I was like, oh my gosh. <laughs> uh, wow. Uh, the Lord has done a lot in my life. And so that, that gives you some of the idea of what the Lord is able to do and what he did do in my life, the healing that he brought for me. Um, <laughs> So as I worked through this depression and I would meet with the Lord every day, one of my requests was, okay, Lord, you see how I look. You see all of this. You're calling me back to being a woman. These are the things you need to do. You need to grow my hair back. You need to change my voice. You need to take off my beard. You need to, I had this whole list. And every day I would bring this list to him. This is what you got to do if I'm going to go back to living as a woman. These things. And after, I don't know, probably two or three weeks, the, the Lord finally spoke to me and he said, you know, I don't care about those things. I was like, well, uh, I'm like, but Lord, these things need to happen so I can look like a woman. And the Lord's like, yeah, I don't, I don't care about those things. And I'm thinking, hmm, okay, different question. Why don't you care about those things? And the Lord said, I don't care about those things because I'm after your heart. I was like, oh, uh, oh. So um, that actually relieved a lot of things because I thought in order for me to ever go forward, I have to, all these physical changes have to happen first. And then I can live fully as the woman that he created me to be. And the Lord's like, no, we're going to start at the ground level. We're going to deal with your heart. And um once I realized I didn't have to worry about all those things, I could really press into the Lord and, and deal with the things that got me into that lifestyle. And again, I, I began to deal with those lies. And one, one of the things that happened very early on is I detached severely from my emotions because in order to, it was so painful in there. You know, all the things that my dad said to my mom, I took them on too, because I was a girl. So I thought they had to be true of me. And so in order to survive, I had to detach from all these emotions because I didn't know what to do with them. And one of them was deep pain. And then also because of how I was physically, I had a deep self-hatred. So the Lord began to work on that, that self-hatred right away. And he also began to reattach my emotions. And that, that season was really scary for me. And so I kept having this picture. I, I was in a room and I could see through this doorway and the Lord was in this other room and he's sitting at a giant switchboard. And so finally, in, in seeing this picture over and over, finally in the last time that I saw the picture, I'm like, well, I'm gonna see what he's doing. So I walked really slowly because I didn't want him to know I was coming and that, you know, like I could really surprise him, but you know, I thought, oh, I'm just going to look over his shoulder. So I get up behind him. I look over his shoulder and there's this huge switchboard and he's pulling out plugs and he's pulling them out. And he's, you know, he's just doing all this, pulling them out, readjusting and plugging them in. And I'm like, oh my gosh, what is this? I mean, he was very intentional with all these things that he was doing. And he was, you know, just all about this switchboard. I'm like, what, what is this? So I said to him, I'm like, what are you doing? And he's like, oh, I'm healing your emotions. He's just like, choo, choo, choo. and these emotions begin to flood me. And I'm like, 
I don't know what to do with all of this. I was, I was wrapped because I'm like, I'm feeling all this stuff and what do I do? And at that point I had gotten a job and I was working as a man because physically I didn't look enough like a woman and the effects of the hormones hadn't gone away enough for me to look like a woman, let alone get a job as a woman. And I can remember I was working in this warehouse and we were preparing a shipment and I had filled one pallet and I grabbed another pallet. And as I grabbed it and I went to put it down on the floor, the, the end of the pallet scraped down my shin. That was not fun. I don't recommend that. And it, it just went down my shin and I just stood there and I kept going, doesn't hurt, it doesn't hurt, it doesn't hurt, it doesn't hurt, this doesn't hurt, it doesn't hurt, it doesn't hurt. And I kept saying that until I convinced myself it didn't hurt. And I was like, okay. And the Lord said, that's how you deal with all your pain. You know, he would say these random things to me very, um, at very purpose times. And I thought, what? That's how I deal with all my pain? And I was like, okay, wow, that's, that's, I need to figure that out. And so as he's reestablished my emotions, I'm beginning to experience stuff. And one day I experienced this emotion and it felt so good. It, I was like, oh my gosh, this feels so good. This feels so good. And I was like, okay, wait, other things that I have felt that were so good, they were not so good. So I asked the Lord, I'm like, what is this? Is this good? Is this not good? I don't know. What is this? And the Lord said to me, that's joy. I was like, oh, this is joy. Oh my gosh. I love joy. This is great. This is great. And so I began to hold out everything to him and say, what is this? I don't know. What is, I don't, what is this that I feel? And he'd say, okay, that is this, or that's, that's pain. That's pain right there. And so he began to work me through the emotions of pain and how to deal with them, how to navigate them, what caused the pain, you know, and it was such a huge deal for me. And so on the, on the heels of that, um, I, I kept seeing this picture of the inside of this room and, um, it was like, all I saw were these little slats, you know, so everything had been taken off the walls. It had take, like taken it down to like the bare bareness of this inside of this room. And I kept feeling really empty. And every time I'd see that picture, I just have this empty feeling. I was like, man, I, I didn't know how to navigate this. And it was, I was really upside down during that time. And I started talking with this guy and I said, you know, he was a, uh, he worked in construction. So I asked him, I'm like, okay, so I have this picture of the inside of this house and everything's taken down except for these little slats, you know, and then there's plaster, I think, in between these slats. I, I don't know, but it looks, everything looks bare. And he goes, oh, well, when you restore a house, you gut it. I was like, oh, yeah, that's what I feel. I feel gutted. I feel totally gutted. And he said, you know, when they, when they got a house, the intention is to bring that house back. The restoration is to bring it back to its original intent to bring it back to its original plan for that house. I was like, oh, well, isn't that interesting? But in that gutting process, you know, so now I have emotions, but I don't know how to be in these emotions. I don't even know how to be. For instance, um, when I lived as a man, you know, I didn't want anybody to know I had ever been a woman. You know, that was, that was not a choice. It was, I had to be all man. And so uh, there was a guy who I admired and he had a certain way that he walked. And so I thought, you know what? I'm gonna figure out how to take on that walk. I'm gonna walk that way because then everybody will know I'm a man. And so I did that. Well, in this gutting process, I suddenly realized I don't know how to walk. I'm like, this is crazy. But I was afraid, you know, as I sat in a big group for me to walk across the room, I'm like, I don't, nothing registered as far as how to do that. I'm like, I don't know how to, I don't even know how to walk. This is crazy. And so I, I eventually kind of figured it out. I felt like, you know, a toddler trying to walk for the first time. Well, 
after I really had this revelation about, you know, I'm being gutted and the Lord is doing all this stuff. The next picture that I saw was the Lord in, in this room. He was like in the corner and he was in front of this huge drawing board. And I was like, well, what is he doing now? So again, I sneak up behind him, you know, and I look over his shoulder and I see these plants and, but I can't make out what they are. And I'm looking at him and I'm looking at him and I'm like, this is, I don't even know what he's looking at, but he's very intentional. He's really just scouring over these plants. He's just really into these plants. He's so just, uh, and so I thought, okay. So I look again over his shoulder and I realized oh, that's the plans for my life. And I was like, okay, whoa, you know, and I, I can't, I, I just knew those were the plants for my life. I can't really explain what that looked like, but you know, as I'm looking over his shoulder, I go, oh, and I step back and of course he looks at me. <laughs> oh yeah. You weren't supposed to know I was here. And I said, Lord, what is that? And he said, it is the plans for your life. I was like, Oh, and what I realized is that the Lord had to gut me because I had created this house. I had, you know, did whatever I needed to for this house to exist, for this house to make it. And so he had to gut me and bring me back to my original intent for the original plans that he had for me. And at that same time, I started studying Psalm 139. You know, because the Lord is very intentional in Psalm 139. He talks about, you know, us raising up. He knows every word. And then, you know, as you go down in that passage, it says, you know, that you knit me together in my mother's womb. Other ones say that, you know, you covered me in my mother's womb. And what I realized from that is that when God knit me together, he knit me together with everything that I needed to be feminine. Ever. And then he put skin on to represent how I'm wired on the inside, how he knit me together. And this is true for men too. Everything that we need to be uh, masculine and feminine, he's put that in there, regardless if we think we function in it or not. It's all in there. And then he put skin on for us to recognize, oh, you're a man, so you're going to be masculine. I'm a woman, I'm going to be feminine. And I was like, I was amazed by that because then I realized he is very intentional. And the thing that really undid me was that I realized that he created me on purpose. He created me on purpose for a purpose. And those were the plans. So he had to get me to get me back to my purpose. And then as it further down, it talks about, you know, wonderfully created am I and my soul knows that full well. And I will say, yes, I do. Because I realized when I lived as a man, there was a nurturing quality I couldn't hide. In fact, when I stepped down from the junior high ministry, the pastor told me, you know, I would watch you with those boys and you are so nurturing. And I thought, what a great woman he would be. Little did he know. Um, but there was also, there's a toughness about men that I couldn't imitate. I tried and I tried and I tried, but there is just a toughness about men I, I couldn't take on. And so as the Lord's doing all this healing, more nurturing is coming out and all, well, eventually all the masculine things about me, you know, just kind of became part of my past. That was an amazing time. And then the next step that he took me through was forgiveness of my dad. And that was um, these were all big things, but this one was really pivotal. And at the Portland Fellowship, I was doing the Taking Background. It wasn't called Taking Background then, but, you know, it was still a program. And um, one of the things that they went through is, what is the name that you cannot call God? And she went through all these names, and I'm like, yep, yeah, chick, yep, yeah, chick, yep, yeah, chick. Yeah, I don't have any problem with that. And um, so the next day, I... I I was going to a graveyard to pray. And for those of you who are familiar with the area, as you go down Burnside towards downtown, there's a graveyard and it's on both sides of the road. Well, I went to the one that's on the right. And if you go straight up that road, there's this turnaround. And that's where I would walk and pray. And the very next day after this teaching, I go up there 
And um, I start to pray and I'm like, Lord. And he says to me, yeah, I want you to call me daddy. I was like, oh, uh, that's the one thing I can't call you because that's what I called my dad was daddy. And I, I told him, I said, I, I can't do that. He goes, yeah, well, when you pray, I want you to call me daddy. And I'm like, I'm not doing that. So I, I came home, shortest time ever, 10 minutes, maybe. And so I thought, okay, well, I'm going to go back the next day. I'm sure he's going to forget. So I get up there and I'm like, Lord. And he's like, yeah, I want you to call me daddy. I'm like, hey, we're done. We're done. Not doing that ever. So for two weeks, it looked like this. Lord, yeah, I want you to call me daddy. Okay, we're done. Lord, I want you to call me daddy. Okay, we're done. For two weeks. And eventually, I'm like, okay, I'm really missing these conversations with you. So I need to figure this out. And I thought I could change his mind by, by then. But yeah, that didn't happen. So on my way up, I'm like, okay, what if, what if I called him daddy? What, what could possibly happen? And then I'm like, that means I'm going to give him that place as my dad. Oh man, that's not going to go well. He's going to be just like my dad and I'm going to be punished. I'm going to be emotionally and verbally abused. I'm going to be emotionally abandoned. I'm going to, you know, I went through all these things. I'm like, but you know, what if he's not like that? You know, there's this other little voice in there going, but what if he's not like that? Like, oh yeah, well, what if he's not? Hmm. Okay, well, I guess we'll see. So I get up to the graveyard and I thought, I'm gonna do this. And there was this curb, and I sat down on this curb, and I I I tell you, here's my confession. I had to muster all the courage that I had to just say that name because in my mind. To call him that was such a dirty word. It was as if I was cussing at him. And I didn't want to do that. He's the Lord. Why would I want to call him my dad or daddy? So I thought, you know what? He's asking this of me. Here we go. So all the courage I had, I sat on this curb and I said, daddy. And something in me broke. I mean, just in two and I broke and I sobbed and I sobbed and I sobbed and I sobbed and I sobbed. And I sobbed so hard and so deep. My sides were sore the next day. That's how hard I cried. And I, I don't know how long I cried, but it felt like a really long time. And once I was able to stop sobbing and kind of straighten myself, this rage rose up in me. I mean, anger, like I have never felt before this intense anger, this rage. And, um, the curb that I was sitting on had a patch of grass next to it. So I took my fist and I'm pounding on the grass with everything that I have. And I'm yelling, I hate you. I hate you. I hate you. And then I realized, oh my gosh, I'm in prayer time with the Lord. I'm like, Lord, I, I don't hate you. I don't hate you. I don't hate you. And the Lord said to me, I know, but you had to for a moment. And what I saw was all this stuff. Um, I saw it be absorbed into the cross. You know, they say, take it to the cross. And I did that and the Lord took it. And I was very different that day from that day forward. And, you know, Every time I thought about that throughout the day, I would just start sobbing because it was just like, I, I, I don't even know how to explain what I felt, but it was so deep. And, um, you know, it was on a Tuesday and so I had to go to PF and I felt like I was one of those goldfish, you know, with the bulging eyes sticking out because I'd cried so much. And so from there, that opened the door for me to begin to work through um, forgiveness of my dad. And uh, so I worked through that process. Again, that was difficult. When I met with uh, the two women that was working with me to take me through forgiveness, they would say the first day, it was like, okay, so they first, they had me make a list. So I did that. And then I, um, I brought it back. And so I'm, it, it seemed like it was a really long list, but I, I sat with the Holy Spirit, I'm like, all right, what is it that I need to forgive him of? And, you know, I'm choo, 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 of course, of all the natural things that I thought of. 
And I took my list. And so they're like, okay, so repeat after me. I forgive my dad. And I'm like, wait, what? Okay. I know I'm supposed to work through forgiveness, but I actually have to say that. And they're like, yeah, it's part of the process. And I'm like, um, I'm not doing that. And so they're like, all right, well, let's come back tomorrow. I'm like, okay. So I realized I, I have to do this. You know, the Lord's really calling me to, this is an opportunity to, you know, finally work through this stuff. So I worked through all that forgiveness, went through the list. It took a week to get through the list and um, it, it was rough. And then when we got to the place, you know, to kind of, you know, finish up the deliverance, they said, now I want you to bless your dad. And I'm like, you want me to what? Uh, no, 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 no. I'm not doing that. Not doing that. So again, they're like, okay, well, why don't you come back tomorrow? <laughs> so I come back and I'm like, all right, let's do this. So forgive my dad. I bless him. And I think and I'm done. This is awesome. Check that off my list. Right. Well, a couple of days later, the Lord said, you know, I want you to reconcile with your dad. And I'm like, what are you thinking? You know, so I'm like, all right. So I send my dad a card with my phone number in it. Sure enough, my dad calls me. So I start the reconciliation process with him. And uh, my dad had a pool table. You know, we grew up playing pool. That's one of the things that he loves. So I was there with my dad and my, my, I have an older brother and a younger brother. And we were playing pool and I was watching my dad and he is being the same jerk, the same guy that I knew. And I was, I was rather peeved. And I said, Lord, I'm going through this reconciliation process with him. And you know what? He hasn't changed at all. And the Lord said to me, uh, well, I'm not asking him to change. I'm asking you. It's like, oh, uh, okay. So I figured out how to um, be kind to my dad. And um, after the reconciliation process, I have to say, I'm really grateful for that. Um, he, he passed, like, I think it was eight years later. And I have no regrets. I have no, I wish I would have, or there's no bitterness. There's none of that. In fact, um, when I bought a house and I was putting some gardening stuff in my dad, both my mom and dad were farmers. And I thought, you know, I wish my dad was here. He would know how to do this or if something would break. I wish my dad was here because he would know how to fix this. And one day I, I realized what I said and I thought, wow, okay, that is some healing. That is some healing. And the memories that I have of him that were really painful. Now they're just memories. I can tell them and there's no pain there. There's no nothing. So I, I was really grateful for that process to go through that forgiveness. It was excruciating though. Um, but I do recommend it because there is freedom on the other side of that. Um, I can't even tell you what that's like, you know, to um, see your dad and not think, I hate you you know, or you're just a jerk. It was like, Hey, how's it going? How's your day? I was truly interested. And, and I've watched my brothers and sisters and they're, they're still in that bitterness thing. And so I'm, I'm grateful for that process. So going forward after the reconciliation with my dad, um, probably about a year later, I was able, you know, the hormones affected the hormones had, um, worn off to the point where I could begin to go back to living as a woman. It was probably about a five and a half year process for all of that, plus all the healing that I went through and working out. And what I realized through that, and one of the things that we teach at the Portland Fellowship is that LGBTQ, that's not a sexual issue. Wanting to live as a man is not a sexual issue. Homosexuality is not a sexual issue. It's a relational issue. When I look back on all the things that the Lord walked me through, it was relational and understanding who I was and that I was valuable and I was loved. That, that's the underlying thing for all of those who are in LGBTQ lifestyle. And you know, to look at that, it actually is a fruit of a deeper brokenness that they're just trying to figure out how to do life and that's how they know how to do life. It's not what they're doing. They don't understand who they are. I didn't know who I was. And so, you know, in the messages that I got that I'm weak, I'm hated and I'm vulnerable to be a man meant I would be safe. That was the opposite of being vulnerable. That was the opposite of being, you know, weak. 
I worked out, you know, I, I was a, I was a weightlifter and I did that to be safe. I did that so I could protect myself and cutting off from my emotions, you know, kept me from being vulnerable. Those are all relational things. So when we look out at those who are struggling, it's not, it's not about, you know, that they're deviant, they're deceived. They're wounded people. I know I was there. I was wounded, you know, and I walked out of that and it was all relational. And the Lord touched on each one of those places in my life that were relational and brought healing to those by him himself and through others. I needed the body of Christ and they were there. Um, so moving forward, you know, I um, continued at the Portland Fellowship and eventually I started teaching there. And when I started teaching, the first thing that I was asked to teach was on femininity. And uh, Jason, he's the executive director of Jason Thompson, approached me and he's like, so what do you think about teaching? And inside, I'm like, I don't want to do that. And I was like, tell him yes. Like, All right. So I go, yes, sure. Yeah, that would be great. I go, well, what would you have me teach on? He's like, well, I would really like you to teach on femininity. I'm thinking, oh, uh-uh, no, 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 no. And the Lord's like, tell him yes. I'm like, no, yes, no, yes, no. Sure, Jason, I would love to teach on that. And so I'm driving home that night and I'm like, Lord, what did you get me into? Me, did you, don't you remember where I came from? What do I know about femininity? You're going to have to get me out of this, okay? Are you going to at least help, help me put this teaching? Because I have no idea what I'm doing. And then I suddenly realized, oh my gosh, what a slap in the enemy's face. Everything that he meant to kill, steal, and destroy has been restored. And now I get to teach from that place rather than functioning from that, that desperate, broken person. I was like, wow, Lord, are you not amazing? So then uh, eventually they had me teach on identity. Imagine that identity. So I was preparing for the teaching and I was looking over the material and I suddenly realized, oh my gosh, I am incredibly free. I'm incredibly free. I was like, how did that happen? You know, I'm no longer attracted to women. I don't wanna live as a man. I don't have any of those desires. You know, I embrace the femininity thing. You know, I'm like, how did that, how did that happen? How did you change my thinking? Because I vowed I would never go back to being a woman. And here I am. And so I asked the Lord, Lord, how'd you do that? How'd you change my thinking? And I saw the Lord ponder my question. Then he says, I don't know. I'm like, okay. Uh, well, how do you not know? How do you not know? Besides, you were there. You walked with me. I know you saw me. I know you were there. How do you not know? How do you not know? And the Lord said to me, I never saw you that way. I was undone because I realized he'd only ever saw me through those plans that he had for me. He only ever saw me as his daughter, ever. Yeah, he knew what I did. He knew I lived as a man, but that's not how he saw me. And so I'm going to leave you with this one truth. I am not the man I used to be. Thank you, uh, Kathy Grace, for uh, sharing, uh, for your vulnerability, your transparency. Uh, I can't think of more words to describe um, and, and the uh, it's it's interesting. Every question that that's coming in right now. And by the way, if you've been uh, waiting to ask your question, you can do that now. Simply uh, open up the chat box and uh, send that question to ask a question, and then uh, I'll be able to ask uh, Kathy Grace live here in the chat. But uh, Kathy Grace, what's interesting is um, m almost all of these questions start out with an affirmation of you, uh, an amazing testimony. Thank you for sharing. Thanks for being honest. Um, so just know that uh, those that are watching the nearly 60 of us uh, mm -hmm. really captivated by how the Lord uh, did a work and is doing a work in your life. So thanks for sharing tonight. Yes, thank you. All right, let's get to it. So question one says, what an amazing testimony. See, I told you. Uh, 
what advice do you have for reaching out to someone who is in that lifestyle and professes to be a Christian, but doesn't want anything to do with discussing transitioning back? Yeah, that's a hard one to navigate. Uh, one of the things you have to realize is they're deceived. They're deceived. They've They've bitten into the lie and they're living that lie and they don't understand the pain that's underneath the why they're living that way. Um, I would encourage you to continue in the friendship. If you have a friendship with them, you know, if you're in relationship to continue in that relationship and um, bring God in where it's appropriate, but get to know them because as a person, they have something to offer you. And really I'm finding that, you know, Christians, I've done this too, um, is we get caught up in you need to know the truth when really they need to know I'm loved. Mm. And the truth will come, but they, they need to see that they're loved by you to give you that place to speak truth. And, you know, I have to say I was in that place too where people would be like, well, don't you know you're living a lie and don't you know and don't you know. And when you come at them that way, and I'm not saying that you are, but should you, you know, or others come at them in that way, it automatically makes them defensive. And they're thinking, you don't understand what I've been through, or you don't understand what it's like to me to be me. And you don't. However, you do understand Christ's love for you. And so if you're, if you're making them a project, don't do that because they'll know. And all that does is heap shame on them because then they're like, oh, you're making me a project. You must think I'm broken because they don't believe that they're broken. So again, continue to walk in that relationship with them, love on them. What's their favorite color? Do they like ice cream? Take them out for coffee, you know, treat them like you would a friend because as you become their friend, then they see that you care for them. And then they're going to be a more open to hearing about Christ. And you can talk about Jesus in your life. You know, what does God do to you, done to you, do through you, share those things without directing it at them, but saying, you know what, the Lord did this for me today. I just got to share that this was so amazing to me, you know, and kind of leave them out of it, but make it about you and Christ. And that's enticing. I will say that's enticing. So continue to be their friend and pray for them. That is your best weapon of warfare is to pray for them and ask the Lord, Lord, how do I reach them? What do I do? Where is it? Where is it that I stand with them? How do I bring them the truth? He'll he'll show you all of that because he loves them just as much. Um, our next question is this: Do you think kids with mental health challenges like autism, Asperger's, are more susceptible to the, to the temptations of a trans lifestyle? And if so, any advice for that situation? Um, I've read some studies and it's pointing to, yes, they are. And it's because, um, from what I've read, autistic kids that are on the spectrum, they feel like they're the outcast already. And so they, they really want to fit in. And that's the big trend right now is to be trans. And so to help them fit in, that's what they want to do. I'm going to be trans so I can fit in because then you'll like me because you don't like me now. And what they don't realize is that you know, then there's the other side of that coin where those who did like them and now they've become trans don't like them anymore. And so it's kind of like this two edged sword. And again, for them, it's it's helping them to understand that they're acceptable the way they are and that you're lovable the way you are, because that's all anybody who is in the LGBTQ lifestyle. And those of us who have come out of it will tell you we were looking for love. We were looking to be loved. We were looking to find value. We were looking for that affirmation that I'm okay. And, and that's really what they're doing too. It's a little different though, because of their challenges autistically, and it may take something different to reach them. Um, I, in the studies that I've read, I haven't, I haven't really found how they have reached them. I know that sometimes though, it's not looking so much at the what, they're doing, it's asking the question, why? And that's true for anybody. Why, why do you want to become a man? Why is that important? What's, what's wrong with being a woman? You know, why, why don't you want to stay a woman? It's asking those questions. Again, autistic is a little different because they do process stuff different. Um, and I'm not quite sure how to speak to that other than going back to, you know, continuing to be their friend, praying for them, um, finding out a way how to reach them in that 
and letting them know that they're loved. Uh, our, our next question, you may have addressed in the first question, um, but this person says, thanks for being vulnerable. Your story was moving. Um, if people are more receptive, if those in the trans lifestyle are more receptive to, to people reaching out that have also struggled, what is our role, those who haven't struggled with this, in reaching out to those that are hurting? Great question. Um, you know, the word talks about uh, weeping with those who weep, you know, bring the comfort where you have been comforted with. And um, I believe that if you ask the Lord, what is a situation that you've walked me through where I've dealt with deep pain that's similar to, to someone in LGBTQ, he will give you that situation and it will help you to understand, you know, how it is that they feel. Yes, it is a different type of thing, but the depth of pain that the Lord met you in and healed you from can be equated because it still comes back to it's a relational issue, right? I'm going to, I'm going to step out risk and say, I think everybody has parent issues. You know, mom and dad hurts, you know, that's just the way it is. And whether your mom, I don't think your mom and dad did it intentionally, but you know, things get interpreted and misconstrued and whatever it causes pain. And so we have this belief, my mom thinks this about me. So again, that comes back to, does she love me? Am I valuable? And, and it's the same for them. They're still looking, I, I want to be loved. And so you look at, you know, I've never struggled with this. I don't understand. Well, you kind of do because there's been a place of pain for you or even a struggle that you've struggled with and you can't get out of that cycle. And so you can relate to them. You know, it may not have been pornography. It could have been anything. Maybe it's, you know, I don't know, lying or stealing, and, but you understand that attachment that it has, that hold on you that you can't seem to get out of. And it's the same, addiction is addiction. You know, sometimes they do go a little deeper, but it's kind of on the same path. And so it's looking at, again, what's in your life that you can go, what is similar? What is something that I've struggled with that I can relate to them, where it's spoken into my value, where it's spoken into my identity? and relate to them from that place and where has God met you and what does that look like for you? I want to thank uh, Debbie for her uh, comment in the group chat. Uh, <laughs> she, she enjoyed it tonight. Gordon had to leave, but uh, incredibly uplifting. Um, Robert, we'll get to your question in a moment. Paul, yours as well. Uh, but here's the, the next question um, is wondering about, so really putting this into practice, the question is, I'm wondering what you think would be helpful for a church to do or approach if a woman, a transgender person living as a man, wants to get involved, uh, if, if, if how best to encourage them, uh, you know, women's events, do you let them choose? Any advice for how we can open the relationship or the door as a church and as individuals to welcome people that were in your situation? Yeah, that's a great question. And those ones are really hard to navigate because if you have a, a trans woman, so a man living as a woman coming into your church and they want to get involved in ministry, I would say don't do it. For one, they're in deception. And more than likely, there's probably some sexual perversion somewhere that they're doing in secret. Um, and you, you don't want to allow that in your ministry. So it's kind of like putting a hole in your ministry, in the wall of your ministry. Um, and you don't, their ideas as far as who they are and what they want to teach your kids, that's a no-go because it's not truth. It comes back to it's not truth. It's their truth and what they believe, but they're in deception. And so the things that they believe and what they want to teach your children, you don't want that. So I would say as far as ministry, they need to, that that's a no. And they need to understand that, you know, I think they need to be set. If, if they, if they want to get involved, then you need to sit down with them and say, Hey, here's our policy as far as being involved. And right now we know, we understand that you're transgender. You're welcome to come here. However, as far as ministry, um, we, we would like to see uh, where you're at in a couple of years. And I think that would be true of anybody who came into your church who you didn't know. We'd like to see where you are in two years. 
um, what, you know, what is the fruit in your life? We have no idea where you're at. Um, you are transgender. So we are concerned about that because biblically we don't believe in that. We believe in man and woman that you're created that way and you're created for a purpose that way. Um, so we'd like to talk to you further about that. Um, and if it's a trans woman, trans woman, uh, I'm sorry, but you know, we, you're a transgender man. So we would prefer for you not to engage in women's activities because that's really not who you are. And again, that's really hard to navigate. And that's if they come to you and want to do that. Now, if they just show up, <laughs> that's a whole nother thing um, to deal with. And again, they have to be taken aside and saying, you know what, this is what we believe. They need to understand what you believe. This is what the word says. This is what the truth is. We, we want to walk with you. But, you know, we also have to have boundaries. Um, for one, we don't know you that well. And um, we would like to see you restored. Now, depending on where they're at, if they're not hungry for the Lord, they're out of there. They'll leave because you're not on their side. You don't understand. Um, you hate them. You're transphobic. You're homophobic, whatever they want to call you. But it still comes down to protecting your flock. And I'm not saying that they're in there to create havoc. They don't, because they don't understand. I didn't understand the deception I was in, you know, I, until I had that encounter with the Lord, I didn't know. And so it's looking at, they don't know, they don't understand. And how do you reach them there? And it's, it's looking at not what they do, but who they are and speaking into who they are. But that, you know, you need, you need the wisdom of the Lord as far as, again, where to meet them at, how to meet them, and how to navigate this. Because it's not, it's not really this one set way of doing it, because every person is going to be different. They're going to have a different temperament. They're going to have a different history. They may just be coming off the street, and they're just hungry for the Lord. And they're just like, I just, you know, I'm in this lifestyle. And, you know, or they could be very deceptive like I was. You saw my pictures. No one knew. And I liked it like that. And so I, I was in the church for probably 10 years and no one knew I was ever a woman until I exposed it. So different scenarios, it's hard to give one answer for that. It's navigating, it's kind of like situation by situation, temperament by temperament, you know, where are they at? Are they hostile? Are they going to be mad? But it's still sticking to the truth. And what does that look like for them in that moment? Uh, Kathy Grace, I want to, um, uh, this is what I told you before we went live tonight. This is what happens. We start with a couple questions and then suddenly the floodgates open. So uh, <laughs> I've got some great questions on the way. Um, for that last question, um, you address that uh, really for like leadership of the church. What about, mm -hmm. I think that the questioner, and, and I apologize to the questioner for mis, uh, reading that, uh, what about for just a regular attender? How, how do they navigate that same question? Sure. So um, since you don't really know them, um, your conversation can't start out with, oh, hey, I see your transgender. Right. <laughs> you know, again, it's, it's meeting them where they're at, treating them with respect. Hi, I'm Kathy Grace. Uh, hey, welcome to church. I haven't seen you here before. What's your name? You know, and they're going to give you your name. Now, you have to to remember there's levels of relationship as far as how you address a transgender so if you have just met them and even though it may be obvious that they're you know living as a woman there used to be a man um then you you know people are like well you can't call him a her you can't call him a she well on that first level you have to meet them where they're at and you know God does. God knows who they are. He can sort out the pronouns later. But again, it's coming alongside of them, helping them to understand you're a safe person. You're not going to judge them because that's going to be their first, um, especially for the, for the trans women, they automatically think that you're going to judge them. You know, I, the men, the women who live as men, they're more deceptive and it's really harder to tell. So that might not be discovered till later, but the, the men are a little more obvious. And so they're, they're probably going to be apprehensive if, 
as far as you approaching them, but just be safe, be, you know, hi, how are you doing? You know, I haven't seen you here, but what's your name? Oh, I'm so glad you're here. And if you're uncomfortable with calling them a name, there's other ways around that. Hey, I'm so glad you're here. It's good to see you. Um, thanks for coming by. Um, there's other ways around using pronouns, but the thing I still go back to is the pronoun thing. We're so eager to make sure that they understand what the real pronoun would be, but we miss the step where we really need to be telling them that they're loved because that's really what they're looking for. They're coming to church because they think, you know, there might be a God who loves me and, and in the church they are supposed to be loving people. And depending on their history, maybe they've already been damaged by the church. I don't know. And they could be angry, but again, it's approaching them, you know, like you would anybody else. Right. <laughs> Even if you can tell, cause I, I go back to the woman at the well, Jesus approached her. He knew her history. He knew. And what did he do? He said, hey, can you give me some water? And she's like, yeah. And he goes, he offered her something different before he said anything about her lifestyle. And it wasn't until she confessed it to him that he said, yeah, you're right. You have five husbands. But he offered her a different way first. He approached her differently first, even though he knew everything. So I think we should take on that same type of thing and go, you know what? I, for instance, I have a friend. It's a woman living as a man. And I call him he and I address him as, as him because I don't have that place to speak into that, you know, as far as him coming back. I have asked him the question, well, how come you don't come back to being a woman if you're so against the hormones? You know, and so I have this relationship with him and I'm just now getting to the place where I can begin to talk to him. You know, have you considered, you know, the healing that the Lord can do? He knows my story and that's why he came to me because he was struggling with the hormones thing, but I came alongside him and I realized, you know what, God can sort out the whole pronoun things later. And that again, that's on this first level of relationship because there's other levels of relationship as far as where it gets trickier for the pronouns. Sorry, that was kind of a winded answer. <laughs> <laughs> that's great. <laughs> um, okay, so these next couple, if we could do a little more rapid fire, I, I, I want right. to get as many folks as we can. Um, so uh, rapid fire style, Paul's wondering what local organizations in your estimation are doing a good job of helping people and what style program or attitudes either stopped or hindered you from transitioning back to a woman. So local organizations, you'd say doing good and any programs or attitudes that maybe slowed down your transition back to a woman. Sure. So here locally, there's Portland Fellowship. Uh, California, there's Equip to Love. On the East Coast, there's Help for Families. And another California one is called Living Stones. There's different ones throughout um, the U.S. that I think are doing a great job. The ones that um, I feel that don't do a good job or are a hindrance are the ones that push you in. They have this religious approach that you need to change this and you need to be doing these things. They have this list of things that you need to be doing rather than just walking with you. All right, uh, Robert's asking, what is, uh, as best as you can in a summation, uh, what is the relationship between gender identity and sexual preference? So gen gender identity is who you are, sexual preference is who you want to have sex with, um, also known as bisexual. So, um, some people put it in sexual preferences, that's who you think you are sexually, like, I guess transgender could fall in that class, but usually sexual preference is who you want to have sex with. Gender identity is, you know, what it is that you portray. Okay. That makes sense? Yes, absolutely. <laughs> okay. Uh, next question is, do you still have friends in the LGBTQ plus community and how do they view your transition back? Um, I actually only have the one, Harley. Um, Pretty much all the friends that I had, I had to cut relationship with just because I was taking a different path and I didn't want to hear what they have to say as far as how bad I am for doing that. And the ones I didn't cut off, they cut me off. So um, I don't. Well, let me put it this way. I work with a lot of people who are in the LGBTQ community. They don't know my story, though. Um, so I guess to answer that, I don't really have any friends in there. <laughs> Um, uh, do you think God can change everyone's orientation if they 
come to him open-handed um, as LGBTQ+, or will some people struggle their whole lives with same-sex attraction even after a conversion? I will say yes and yes. Um, those who have been um, fully, if I can put it this way, those who have really been transformed have lived a surrendered life. Those who I know who have also come out of LGBTQ, they have lived a surrendered life. Those who have struggled with the lifestyle, there's something there that they won't give up. Pornography being a big one. Um, not really addressing the attraction issues, just going, I'm attracted and I don't know how to do this, but they're not looking at the root. So if they get to the root of that, it, it, does, it does go away. And, um, or I, I should say you can heal from that. Um, this person's asking, um, how did you get out of your depression? Uh, you know, I think what happened is after I spent that year, I realized I had to get a job. So I began to do stuff. I, the depression was still an issue, but slowly as I continued to heal and begin to look at those things um, that, you know, I needed to be healed, like my emotions and all those things, um, it slowly, it kept getting less and less and less and less and less. Um, do you feel, I mean, in, in listening to your story, it was very early on where uh, the first church interaction that was not positive. Um, do you feel like the church, the big C church or that church let you down? Um, no, because they didn't understand. They didn't know what to do. And so, you know, this was early 80s. So back in the early 80s, it's like, oh, well, we just cut them out. We just kick them out. That's the best thing because, you know, you, that's just the way it's handled. So I, you know, I, I don't think, like I said, they just didn't understand what to do or how to handle that. Um, okay, here is a, 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 a medical question for you. So um, I recently read a medical study that showed the brain waves of trans people aligned more with the gender they chose. So how do I reconcile this type of information? I know that our choices and thoughts affect our brain and can change our brains, but I just can't debate this away with God created you. Uh, they thank you for any insights in how to respond for the, uh, to the world of medical science, trying to affirm this type of deception. Yeah, that's a hard one. Um, so, you know, the word talks about renewing your mind. And I, you know, I believe that as you deal with, I, I don't know about the brain waves necessarily, but I do know that there's neurons and neuron paths as far as how we think. And they do get engraved. And when you believe a lie long enough, then that becomes a truth. I believe that I should have been born a boy. And so that was my truth. And it wasn't until I began to unpack why I believe that, that I was able to change my thinking because it was intercepted by the truth. Again, it's, you know, it's, it's the truth versus the lie. And it's, and it's getting to a place where the lie um, is less believable and the truth is more believable. And it did change my thinking. My thinking changed. Um, I know because there's things I used to think and I would think, you know, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do that. And it was like a guy. And now I'm like, I would never do that. Mm. Um, going, going back to your, uh, the, the question about how to um, approach uh, a transgendered person at church, because I think, I mean, it's 2021, the reality of that happening in our churches is, is very possible. Do you feel like there is the, the challenge or the fear with that is that, yes, I think you address this, that, okay, you don't accept me. You don't affirm me. This mm -hmm. is just another aff affirmation. The church doesn't want me. So how do you, I mean, have you had experience of success with that, with kind of how you explain to us, here's what I would do and then treat them with love, just like you would anyone else that's new. Sure. Um, so I haven't really ran into anybody in church necessarily, but we do have those that come through the program that, you know, they're there because their friends have drug them there or whatever. Um, and it's coming up to them and saying, you know what, um, I want to know, because, you know, they're constantly negative, 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 blah, 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 blah. And so I've asked them point blank, why are you here? 
why are you doing this program? You know, and it'd be the same if they're coming against the church, you know, the church, this and this. So why are you here then? What are you looking for? You know, ask them those questions so they can begin to think, well, why am I here? You know, what am I trying to get out of this church? Because they're there for a reason. It's trying to figure out what that reason is and then navigate from there. Mm. Uh, today, um, uh, today, do you find, I mean, as I, as I was telling Kathy Grace before we went uh, online tonight, uh, do a Google search of Kathy Grace <laughs> Duncan and you will find she has been interviewed um, all over the place and, and been part of articles and stories. It's an incredible God honoring testimony. Um, so as you are met today, uh, are you met with understanding, acceptance, or, or conversation? I would say D, all of the above. Um, though I will say I've never had a hostile meeting. Wow. Um, I have approached protesters and said, hey, why are you here? You know, what do you, what, do you have questions about this conference? Do you have, do you know what we're doing in there type of thing? But people uh, that I've met have mostly been Christian. In fact, I was asked that question. So what is Portland? You know, when you meet people from Portland, you know, how does the LGBTQ community treat you? And I'm like, you know, honestly, I think I'm the best kept secret because I don't, I don't have those interactions. And the people who seek me out are looking for help. You know, they're, they're looking for change. They're not looking to debate with me. Mm. Um, okay, I've got uh, um, uh, this question. It's a little long, so let me read it and I can repeat anything I need, you need me to. I have a progressive Jewish friend whose son all of a sudden decided he wanted to be a girl and is living as a girl. I have an issue with this because she is stopping his puberty process from going naturally. I'm afraid I may have alienated her because I strongly disagree with not letting him develop and make this decision once he was an adult. How do I go about repairing this relationship and show her the love of God? I think her Jewishness is only in culture, not in her heart. She consistently complains about his behavior and doesn't want a Christian interjection. So I went with the Old Testament and when he was having a fit, I told him to remember that God said, you shall honor your father and mother. She told me <laughs> not to say that to him again. I don't understand. It's almost like she wants him to be, quote, broken. Yeah, so that is one of the levels of relationship that I was talking about. And that's parent-child. And that's a hard one because um, the child probably already has offenses um, concerning the parents. There's a reason why they're offended. And you know, you can say anything to them and they're gonna, they're gonna be offended. You can affirm them and they're gonna get offended. I would encourage you to figure out where do you fall on the transgender issue? Are you okay with calling your son her? And if you are, why are you? Because he wasn't created that way. In calling your son her, um, you're actually affirming the lie. You're agreeing with the lie with him. Um, now I get that maybe you need to navigate that a little bit and um, kind of go with the flow for a little bit, but you also have to come to a place where you're gonna stand on the truth and you have to make that boundary. You need to have a conversation with your son saying, this is what I believe. And I am struggling to watch you become this woman. And yeah, I disagree with you going with the puberty blockers. You need to be honest with your child. But at the same time, you need to press into them and say, I don't understand why you want to become a woman. Can you help me understand why you want to become a woman? So there's a compassionate component that you need to approach them with and try to understand, press into that. I, I don't know. Where did you? Where did you hear about this? What made you think being a woman was better? Asking those questions, seeking that, and then just hearing what it is. And if you wanna risk even further, you can ask them, is there a place where I've hurt you in this? You know, has your dad hurt you? Sometimes they've been molested and being the opposite sex makes them feel safer. So figure out where you land, draw your boundary, have that conversation. Kathy Grace, we have uh, time for just a couple more questions. Um, 
uh, this question may be related to what you were just sharing. Medical societies encourage letting a child lead and be su being supported with hormones fairly early with surgery following later, the, as later they identify as transgender. Scientific articles also point to better mental health after affirmation surgery. If this issue comes up, how do we have a conversation without being automatically labeled as a bigot or anti-science? Well, the other side of that is studies are showing if, um, for one, the child's brain isn't even developed, how can they make a decision about their gender? You know, and what, how are the parents affirming that? You know, again, are they looking at why does my kid want to do this? What's, you know, is there something in the family dynamic that's making them think it's safer to be a man or a woman? Um, but it's also, um, sorry, I just lost my train of thought. Um, it's also looking at the, the other side of the story is that the kids who have been made to wait, um, their parents have said, no, we're not doing the puberty blockers. No, we're not doing this. You're, you need to wait. You need to wait till you're 18. To you, then you need to move out and you need to do whatever. Well, in that waiting process, they come to a place where they realize, no, I want to stay this. And then there's other ones that they go in and they have an appointment. They walk out with hormones that day. They start the hormone therapy. And within a month, maybe to a year, they have the surgery. And again, they have transitioned out of that. We're seeing a lot of the women who went and lived as man are transitioning out of that now because they said, I, once I got to a certain age between 17 to 22, they're like, no, I, I wanted to be a woman. I wish I would have waited. So there's the other side of the coin that's saying, okay, these studies are out also saying if they would have waited, they would have grown out of that. Because there is that common tomboy, there is, you know, boys play with dolls or whatever, but they all grow out of that. And it can be nurtured in a way that their, their identity is nurtured. So one of the approaches now in the mental health is, I think we should wait and see. And back when I transitioned, I had to live as the opposite sex for two years because they wanted to know I was stable. Mm -hmm. The other lie that's out there that's very, um, it's damaging is that, well, if I, if I don't go along with my child, they're going to commit suicide. Okay, well, they could have the surgery, which intensifies everything that they're struggling with and still commit suicide. Your affirmation is not going to save them from suicide. Um, Kathy Grace, before we get to uh, our, our final question of the night, um, uh, the, the website for Taking Back Ground, uh, um, what is the website uh, as a resource for those that want more? Sure. Um, actually, if you go to portlandfellowship.com, there's a place on there for Taking Back Ground, and you can read about the um, ministries that we have there. We also have one for friends and family called the Hope Group. That can also be found at portlandfellowship.com. Uh, the program is a two-year program, and it's for those who are struggling with unwanted same-sex attraction. It's a um, discipleship program, and we walk through and look at the roots and relational issues, and uh, you have a small group of time uh, to go with that. Awesome. Thank you. And yeah. um, before I ask this last question, which um, I, I'm, I'm really appreciative of the person that asked it, uh, a reminder about next month's uh, Friday Forum. Um, Adrian Toter will be the speaker uh, talking about public school and faith at the crossroads and uh, how to navigate that. That will be on Friday, April 16th. Again, uh, Adrian Toter doing that talk. You can find out more and uh, get a reminder and be on the email list uh, at theambassadorsforum.com. Uh, Kathy Grace, uh, this is the final question. And, and again, uh, I, I so appreciate whomever wrote it. This is what it says. I want to read it exactly as it's written. If I'm being totally honest, they write, and you have inspired me by your own testimony, I'm not comfortable around transgender people. So what advice do you have for me to become a better person and Christian in this area? Great question. I would encourage you to not see them necessarily as transgender, but to see them as someone who's deeply wounded, deeply broken. Um, and again, they, they're doing this because they are looking for a way out of their pain and um, figuring out how, 
how can I see them beyond the transgender? Because that's not who they are. That's what they're doing. And they're doing that for a reason. But just seeing them that they're desperate people, broken, hurting, they've probably been rejected, abandoned. They've probably been abused sexually, um, physically, emotionally. You know, there's probably a ton of abuse in there. They've probably been raped. You know, um, a lot of the people that I've dealt with have a um, lots of abuse, sexual abuse in their in their background. And that's another reason why it propels them to become a man, because as a woman, they were raped over and over and over. You know, as a man, they were sodomized. And so they think it's safer to be a woman because they have more power. If they're a woman, they can say no over their body. So look at them as deeply broken and desperate and see if you can have compassion on that. And I guess my last question is, uh, when God invited you to be happy again, how's your happiness today? Oh, over the top. Okay. <laughs> Incredible. Kathy yeah. Grace Duncan, thank you for being our guest tonight on our Friday Forum. Uh, to the more than 50 of you, nearly 60 of you that joined us this evening, Thank you for being part of tonight's event. Again, learn more at theambassadorsforum.com. Uh, for tonight, I'm Brian Mengel. Thanks for being here and good night and see you next month.